Okay. Can you hear me? Great. <laughs> now, you, you hear me directly, and the camera hears me through the mic. Anyway, so some of you may, may have been wondering what the Rosetta Stone is doing here on the beach. You may have speculated that it's because we're in Tel Aviv, and Tel Aviv is on the beach. Now, that's, that's not the reason, and I will explain. Uh, two years ago, I published an astrophysics textbook, and at some point, uh, the publishers asked me for a proposal for the cover. Um, so I came up with this idea. Uh, and I, I sort of like this concept because it shows uh, the whole range in astrophysics from the nearest star, the sun, out to the furthest thing that we can see, the microwave background. And it's the spots, the anisotropy in it are shown here in the right scale, angular scale, as we'll hear today. That's a very important thing. Uh, and it's really the same physics, optical depth one, optical depth one. Uh, and it's basically the same physics that we see here on the beach, although, of course, on the beach there's a lot more condensed matter physics, which is much, much more complicated. Uh, anyway, uh, the publishers told me that this is interesting, but they're thinking actually of putting just some pretty astronomical picture on the cover. And I said, well, okay, but just don't put a picture of a galaxy because all astrophysics textbooks have pictures of galaxies on their cover, and mine, mine is special. Uh, so this is, this is real. <laughs> But anyway, now is, uh, now is an opportunity to, to recycle this. And actually, the Dan was already there. We just had to change Dan <laughs> Oz to Dan David. So that's how we got here. Anyway, uh, to get back to our business, I'd like to uh, start with the first talk. Uh, as just like the Dan David is separated to themes, past, uh, present, and future, the three talks by our three laureates are also structured along these lines. The first talk will be more about the, the background and the past of this subject uh, and so on. Uh, so our first speaker uh, will be Professor Paul Richards. Uh, Professor Richards got his BA at Harvard in 1956. He went on to get a PhD from Berkeley in 1960. He spent six years at Bell Labs and then since 1966 he's a professor at Berkeley. Among his many uh, distinctions and honors, he's a, national, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he, in 1981, he was uh, chosen as the California Scientist of the Year. In 1997, he got the Button Prize. Uh, in 2000, the Isaacson Prize of the American Physical Society. And of course, this evening, he'll be getting the Dan David Prize. And we, of course, uh, are looking forward to the next big prize. Uh, so without further ado, we'll start our symposium. Paul, please. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here under such auspicious circumstances. It's my first visit to Israel, although I've known many people from this institution coming through Berkeley over the years. I've been at Berkeley forever, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to talk about a subject that I've worked on for more than half of my career, the measurements of the cosmic microwave background. And I plan in this talk to talk a little bit about the development of measurement techniques which have taken place due to the efforts of enormous numbers of very intelligent and dedicated people. And I'll illustrate that by just looking at one aspect of the, te of the experimental techniques, the developments of detectors. I will also talk about the microwave background and the number of angular scales and what is learned from it. And, um, well, try to give those of you in the audience who are not experts 
a feeling for what's going on. <clears throat> yes. Cosmic microwave background is, of course, black body radiation. Uh, 2.7 Kelvin means that it's microwaves and especially millimeter wavelengths. It's very uniform throughout the universe and isotropic as viewed from the Earth. It's 70% of all of the electromagnetic energy in the universe. It's more than X-rays, visible, ultraviolet, radio combined. And the most important thing about it is that it gives a snapshot of the universe at a very specific time. Yep. <laughs> yes. It's 379,000 years after the Big Bang. What? Oh. Really push. Okay. We get this snapshot. And I don't really need it. Uh, <laughs> our most, it is our most important cosmological observable. There were Nobel Prizes in 1978 for Penzias and Wilson for the discovery, and in 2006 for Smoot and Mather for measurements of the spectrum and the primordial anisotropies um, using the, co the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite. Now here's a view of the universe from the Earth. It's called our observable universe. And we can see anything in principle inside a sphere whose radius is the velocity of light times the time since the Big Bang. And anything outside of that is in principle not observable because the light hasn't had time to reach us. If your universe were sufficiently transparent, we could actually see the Big Bang because looking far away is looking back in time. But as we approach it, uh, the matter becomes hot enough to become ionized. And so what we see, our view is blocked by a wall of plasma, which is very much like the surface of the sun. It's about the same temperature, about the same density. It's a hydrogen plasma with a little helium. And it radiates visible and ultraviolet light very copiously. So that radiation, some of it finds its way to us. But it's redshifted by the fact that this surface is moving away from us at nearly the velocity of light. So we see it as 2.7 Kelvin black body radiation. Now, I didn't get this view graph from the Dan David uh, symposium, but I've used it for years. It uh, really is true. The experiments I'm going to describe are the black body, the measurement of the spectrum, measurement of what is called dipole anisotropy, which is one direction versus another. Uh, the primordial anisotropy, which is in a few degrees to a few tens of a degree scale the anisotropy on the scale from a few tenths of a degree to a few degrees, then going to much smaller angular scales like arc minutes, the sinai zeldovich effect, and finally we'll break out of this uh, ordered set of decreasing angular scales of temperature and talk about the polarization anisotropy. But many of these topics will be uh, discussed in depth by um, the later speakers, and so I'll skip over the things that they will cover. The spectrum of the microwave background early on was measured with heterodyne receivers, radio receivers at microwave frequencies the, the, of the type that were developed for radar and communication, and then later on using bolometers, which are thermal detectors, where we measure the heat absorbed from the radiation. I'll talk about work by David Wilkinson at Princeton, an experiment that Dave Woody and I did and released in 79, and then the experiment on the COBE satellite. So this is an example of an early spectrum measurement. This is a log linear plot. The black body curve is a straight line in the Rayleigh genes region. You see these data points give the slope and amplitude very precisely. This is Dave Wilkinson's data. And what he was interested in, he was the prediction that this curve would start to bend over. And the, the highest frequency point gives a hint of that. 
Now, this is about where I entered the field, and my interest was to explore what happens out here. The black body theory says that this curve will drop uh, exponentially. Now, there were reasons why we couldn't go on in this way using heterodyne receivers. One was that the heterodyne receivers at these higher frequencies were poorly developed and very insensitive. Another was that radiation from room temperature objects uh, was going up like this and getting hugely bigger than the signal at these high frequencies. Another reason was that the Earth's atmosphere was not increasing as frequency squared, but although there were spectral lines, the average was increasing as the fourth power of the frequency. So this had to be a radically different experiment. We used a Fourier transform spectrometer and a bolometric detector and put the entire apparatus in superfluid liquid helium, put it onto a stratospheric balloon, and measured the spectrum of the sky. The detector that was used was something called a composite bolometer. Here we have a flake of sapphire, as thin as we could make it, about five millimeters on a side, with a metal film which absorbed the radiation. It had a sheet resistance of about 200 ohms per square, and a little thermometer, sometimes called a germanium resistance thermometer, which was very well known by uh, two low temperature physicists. All this was operated, in this case, at helium-3 temperatures. And so this whole object would heat up when radiation was absorbed, and you'd measure the temperature change. This was a very successful detector. For the next 20 years, it was used for essentially all microwave background bolometric experiments, and is still used for condensed matter spectroscopy in the laboratory. I won't show you the apparatus because time is short, but here's the, here are the results of what was known in 1979. This point was Penzias and Wilson's initial discovery. These points by David Wilkinson. Ray Weiss's pioneering balloon effort. Our experiment, shown as plus and minus one standard deviation estimated statistical errors, is this thing here. There are gaps because of strong atmospheric lines. This experiment wasn't completely correct. The antenna wasn't cold enough. There's a little extra signal, about 5% in this region. But taken together, this was all that was known about the spectrum of the background radiation for 12 years. At the end of that time, the FIRAS experiment on Colby published, and the situation improved dramatically. John Mather was a graduate student in my group and did a little work on this experiment as a student. He went off to NASA, wrote the proposal for a spacecraft mission measuring the microwave background spectrum. He used the same antenna, the same Fourier spectrometer, the same bolometer, but put in 15 years of hard work to make an absolutely perfect measurement, and you all know the result. This is a linear linear plot of a black body curve. The line is Planck's theory. The, the boxes are experimental data, but the air bars are so small that they could not be seen on this plot. And the temperature was 2.735 Kelvin. A spectacularly beautiful experiment for which John shared in the Physics Nobel Prize in 2006. At the same time we were working on our balloon experiments, there was another experiment going on at Berkeley in the Alvarez Particle Physics Group using heterodyne receivers on an aircraft to measure the, what, is, what is called the dipole anisotropy. And um, it's a Doppler shift. Uh, there is a coordinate system called the co-moving reference frame, which just expands with the expanding universe. And if you're fixed in that reference frame, then the background radiation is a perfect, um, it's perfectly isotropic. But if you're moving relative to that reference frame, there is a Doppler shift. So they measured that Doppler shift using very conventional heterodyne receivers uh, with two horns like this at 90 degrees, which every once in a while were switched. They were measuring the difference between the signals, and by switching them, they were able to cancel out uh, any differences in sensitivity. 
So it's a very nicely performed experiment, a very nice experimental design. And this is the result that they got. It shows that in some direction, the background radiation is three millikelvin, that is one part in a thousand hotter. And in the opposite direction, 180 degrees, it's three millikelvin colder. So this effect comes from motion. And the primary dominant effect is the Milky Way galaxy falling into the Virgo cluster of galaxies at about 500 kilometers per second. So this was very nice because if it had not been there, nobody would have believed that the microwave background radiation had cosmological origin. It just had to be there. So I'd like to move on to smaller angular scales down to the few tens of a degree to few degree scale to the measurement of something called the primordial or original fluctuations. And this was measured by the COBE satellite, uh, the differential microwave radiometer experiment, George Smoot was PI, and using heterodyne receivers. In fact, he used an apparatus very similar to the Berkeley Airborne apparatus. And this is a, a pattern in microwave background work. The small experiment, uh, develops an experimental technique, and then something like it, but much improved, goes onto a spacecraft, and you get much more precise measurements. So both have their role in the development of the subject. The reason this 10-degree uh, uh, anisotropy is about a factor 100 weaker than the dipole, but mostly that came because of long observing, four years of observing time on the COBE satellite. So where does this stuff come from? We think there was a period called the inflationary period in the early universe. And during that time, the universe was expanding exponentially. Uh, it's a very peculiar situation. There, we, have, we don't have a theory of inflation. We have about 50 theories, which suggests that none of them work very well. Uh, but the generically, People talk about the universe being a quantum system with gain and having quantum fluctuations. And that is thought to be the original source of structure in the universe. And this structure has a very peculiar property. It's on all angular scales, the same amount of amplitude of power on all angular scales. It's called scale invariant structure. Strangely enough, this, these quantum fluctuations are com quite analogous to the quantum noise, uh, the fluctuations in the photon uh, field in a coherent receiver, such as a heterodyne receiver. So this is the result you all know from the COBE satellite. Uh, these are hot spots and cold spots on this plasma surface at the edge of the observable universe. The smallest spots here are about seven degrees across, which was the beam size for the, the DMR telescopes. There was a contribution from the uh, uh, galactic plane across here, which has been very carefully subtracted out uh, by measuring at several frequencies. A beautiful experiment. And this gave the average values of these fluctuations which enter into cosmological theories. Well, let me go back to that for a moment and say uh, these fluctuations are thought to be just the same as were created at the time of inflation. And that is because such big things when projected onto this plasma surface are such huge objects that there hasn't been time for gravity to distort them, to make them collapse or otherwise change. So they're unmodified in the times from inflation up to the radiation of the, big, of the black body radiation. Um, if, however, you look at smaller structures, which Kobe couldn't see, say from tenths of a degree to a few degrees, then these are much smaller structures, and there has been time for gravity to modify them. And so these are evolved. They show evolution. The process is called acoustic oscillations. 
By this time, the microwave background community had grown much bigger, and there were many, many experiments tracing this effect. Using bolometers, the heterodyne receiver had gone rather out of fashion by then, and it was replaced by a high electron mobility transistor amplifier, which again had been developed for the radar and communications fields and did a beautiful job of microwave background measurements. Uh, the experiments we'll be talking about here are Boomerang and Maxima. That'll be the topic of Paolo de Benares' talk. After that, three years later, the WMAP satellite Planck, the European Space Agency, launched last Thursday, and it carries the uh, capability to make these measurements even more precise. So here's the story about how these structures evolved with time. This is a timeline. This time was the time of this inflationary expansion. And there were, there were structures on all angular scales with the same uh, power at, on every scale. But as a function of time, gravity would cause an overdense region to collapse. So at the time the microwave background was radiated, the time that the plasma, this red stuff, disappeared, uh, you'd have a smaller patch on the sky. The smaller patches might compressed so much that radiation pressure caused them to rebound or even several rebounds. And so when, what we measure over here does not have scale invariant structure. Certain angular scales are favored and other angular scales are disfavored. So there's a theory of this. It was due to uh, Peebles and Wu and to uh, Sunyaev and Zeldovich. Uh, they worked independently, published the same year. And uh, this theory was published 30 years before the critical measurements. But it turns out that the data fit the theory perfectly. But before the data came in, you could just plop the theory, and it depended on what you chose for the cosmological constants, which of these curves you might get. This is a power spectral density as a function of an angular frequency. This is the standard way of representing quantitatively what these fluctuations look like. And if there's a high level here, it just means that there are a lot of fluctuations with this angle. The uh, line along here is L, the quantum number of the spherical harmonic, because you're doing your power spectrum in spherical harmonics. So the idea then was to make a map of the sky, Fourier analyze it, compare it to these plots, and deduce values of the parameters. So here's the result of an early experiment, a balloon experiment that Andrew Lang and I were involved with, along with Phil Lubin. And it was just a measurement of a strip across the sky. Uh, and at a frequency corresponding to the peak of the black body curve, we saw structure. And then we went to a higher frequency where the black body curve had dropped to half its value. We saw highly correlated, the same, same structure, but half as big. And at higher frequencies where the black body curve had disappeared completely, we saw hardly any structure, and what there was was uncorrelated. So we were seeing degree scale CMB anisotropy. In fact, some experiments saw this even before the COBE DMR publication. So they saw evidence for fluctuations before COBE. However, the amount of data here is just not sufficient to make a reliable average. And it's these average fluctuation which is important for cosmology. And so the COBE DMR experiment deserves all the credit that it gets. Well, I said there were a lot of people working in this field. This is a power spectrum, but except it's on a, on a uh, log scale here. That dotted line is the theory for a particular universe. And that particular universe was the favorite one at the time. Just by guess, people said the universe is probably flat and that uh, it probably had a cosmological constant. And it probably had dark matter and not uh, cold dark matter, not hot dark matter. And so it gave this curve. And those were the measurements. So at this time, um, Paolo 
along with uh, Francesco Melchiori in Rome, Andrew and I came to the conclusion that everything was right to do much more powerful balloon experiments and try to regularize this situation. But this required a much better detector. And this was a detector developed by Andrew and his then postdoc, Jamie Bach. You're looking at a sheet of silicon with a hole in it. And across that hole is a membrane of silicon oxynitride, which has been optically lithographed into a spiderweb pattern. And in this central region, which is maybe uh, two wavelengths across for the radiation being detected, um, the spiderweb was metallized with gold with a sheet resistance average of 377 ohms per square, so it absorbed the microwave background photons. The reason for this structure was that balloon altitude, there are a lot of cosmic ray secondaries, and there were plans to fly at the South Pole near the South Magnetic Pole where there were many of these secondary cosmic rays. And so this structure is open so that more than 90% of the cosmic rays just go through the holes and don't cause any uh, glitches. So it was a background reduction technique. There were also benefits from its high resonant frequency and its low heat capacity. This has been an enormously successful detector for more than, a, well, about 15 years now. It's been used for all rapidly changing situation it was. Now I'll go to even smaller angular scales down to arc minutes. And there's an effect called the sunyayev zeldovich effect. Uh, arc minutes is the angular scale for clusters of galaxies, he, these huge conurbations of hundreds to thousands of galaxies. And when the microwave background passes through these galaxies, it's Compton scattered by a hot electron plasma. And uh, that effect is very useful for locating clusters and for studying them. So you need, however, a big telescope to get arc minute resolution at microwave background frequencies. It has to be 10 meter class, so that has to be on the ground. There's one that we're working on at in the high Atacama Desert, another at the South Pole. Our Berkeley group, I'm retired now, but uh, Adrian Lee is running the group extremely well uh, and working with Bill Holtzapfel. I have built receivers to go onto these telescopes to look for the sunyayev zeldovich effect. But not only do we need a big telescope, but we need much higher sensitivity. And the sensitivity of individual detectors is limited by the atmospheric signals. And so we need lots of detectors. So at Merkin, we developed a new detector technology, and others have worked on this very hard. Here's a silicon wafer. Each of these spots is a spiderweb barometer. Uh, there are six of these wedges make up the focal plane for the South Pole Telescope, so that's 960 barometers. The, the difference in the technology is that the thermistor, the temperature measuring device, is now a superconducting transition edge thermometer. And the readout amplifier is now a superconducting quantum interference device, a squid. The advantages of that technology are that you make the whole thing with optical lithography. That helps you make large focal planes. The squid has quite a large uh, noise margin, and it allows you to do output multiplexing. If we had a single squid amplifier for every detector on this experiment, there would be over 7,000 wires going into the low temperature part of the cryostat. That is simply out of the question. And so what we do is we take a group of detectors, we bias them at different frequencies, combine the currents through a single amplifier, and then further analyze the result at room temperature and separate out the signals. And this is called output multiplexing. And it is developed by our group and by the group at NIST at, in, the, in uh, Boulder and uh, by others. And these new technologies, are revolutionizing what can be done. Here's just one Sunyaev-Zeldovich image. All this stuff here 
is a microwave background on isotropies, but that thing is not a hot spot, it's a cold spot. And that's a cluster of galaxies because the Compton scattering with the plasma has scattered the photons out of our frequency band, and so we we're seeing less. And that's the signal which is used to locate and study clusters of galaxies. So I'm moving along to the end of my talk here. And the last thing I'll talk about is polarization anisotropy. Up until now, everything has been temperature anisotropy. But the field of polarization anisotropy has been getting more and more interest. And uh, and we will we'll talk about that. I don't have to say very much, but let me just point out the implications for detector technology. Um, let me just say that there are lots of ground-based experiments, balloon experiments. The Planck satellite had some polarization capability. And there's discussion, a lot of serious discussion, on the potential design of a dedicated polarization anisotropy space mission. Here's an example of where detectors are going to do this new kind of experiment. We would like to have each pixel in the focal plane measure two orthogonal polarizations. And so in this case, this is done with uh, antennas. Uh, here's a sheet of niobium on silicon. There's a slot here and a slot there. They make a double dipole slot antenna. The output signals come on superconducting transmission lines. This is all really microwave technology, but at higher frequencies through transmission line bag pass filters to a TES bolometer. The orthogonal polarization is picked up by these two antennas, which go down through another uh, set of band pass filters to a second bolometer. So each pixel then measures two polarizations. Now, it's a characteristic of these measurements, the so, especially the so-called B-mode polarization, is so tiny that we really need an enormous number of pixels. And we're running out of space in the focal plane. The size of the pixel in the focal plane is maybe twice the wavelength. Can't change that. The size of the focal plane is set by the telescope aberrations. And there isn't enough space. So what we can do is make each pixel not only measure two polarizations, but perhaps two or three frequencies. And that would be done by branching off from these transmission lines into a separate filter at a different frequency and to a separate bolometer. So that kind of work is going on at Berkeley and other places, as you will hear from Andrew, have other approaches to this, but it's a very exciting what, new area. Scale of this pixel? Oh, the uh, dipole antenna is, is over half a wavelength. So if we're talking about two millimeter waves, that, that, that sets the, the scale. OK. Um, what I've talked about is barometer development as an example, as a surrogate for all of the many, many uh, experimental technological breakthroughs that have been made in order to make this field really work. And uh, with these bolometers, in 40 years, we've had a, a factor 10 to the ninth increase in sensitivity. Uh, that means the speed of the measurement has doubled every year for 40 years. That's faster than Moore's law. And you know what a revolutionary situation the computer world is in. And so you see what has been happening here. Um, we're now at the photon noise limits, so the detectors won't get any more sensitive, but we're using large format arrays. During this discussion, I've rather slighted the coherent receivers. And I'll show a couple of slides to show you what has been happening. This is a coherent, that is microwave style, receiver that is a polarimeter. It's made up by bolding separate microwave components together. This is for 90 gigahertz, and it measures two polarizations. Now, largely due to the pressure of the Planck experiment, there's been a breakthrough in packaging. And this receiver does the same thing. 
and it's about three centimeters square. In the meantime, there's been an increase of sensitivity by of the order of a factor of 100. But remember, this technology started from a much more secure base than the, the bolometers. Even so, it seems likely that the next generation of big microwave background experiments will be largely bolometer experiments uh, because of the ease of making big arrays and other technical reasons. So I'll stop the talk there and just say a few personal things. I've been told that the coming speakers will talk a little bit about the mentors they've had for their physics careers. I certainly had some very good ones. My father, who used his physics training to help found a field called soil physics and its applications to desert agriculture, taught me experimental physics in the basement as a schoolboy. My PhD thesis advisor, Michael Tinkham at Berkeley, and my postdoc advisor, Sir Brian Pippard at Cambridge, taught me infrared spectroscopy, uh, microwave measurements, superconductivity, and low temperature physics. But none of these people knew were working on the microwave background. My shift into this field was caused by Charles Towns, a very famous physicist at Berkeley, who tried to encourage me who said, why don't you take a look at the microwave background? He made it sound very interesting, which it is. He also implied that with my experimental background, it shouldn't be too much of a problem, which was completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, I'm very grateful to him for the suggestion. It was a wonderful thing to do, a midlife career change. But it wouldn't have worked except for one fact. This field has attracted an amazing number of just brilliant graduate students, postdocs, and collaborators. Uh, there's something about it that just grabs people and makes them work very, very hard. And so it's my students and postdocs who are responsible for the successes we've had. And as, a, as an example of that, take Andrew Lang. He was the sort of graduate student and postdoc that would make any professor look good. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We can we can take a couple of quick, very questions that are relevant to Professor Richard's talk, or we'll have a, we'll also have some time in the end for questions to everybody. So anything urgent? <laughs> okay. So thank you. Uh, take the microphone. Oh yes. Okay. Okay, so our uh, second speaker is uh, Professor Paolo de Bernardis. Uh, Professor de Bernardis uh, is a native of Florence. Uh, he got, he started his uh, physics studies there and uh, got his degrees in Rome in La Sapienza, all including his PhD in 1987. Uh, and he's uh, been on the faculty there since. He became a full professor in 2001. Uh, he's the Italian PI of the Boomerang experience, experiment that we're hearing about, and also the Italian coordinator of Maxima and Archaeops. Uh, among the prizes he's received is the Feltrinelli Prize of the Acad Accademia dei Lincei. Uh, some of you may have heard that's the academy that was founded around uh, Galileo's time. Galileo was one of the first members, and I, I just read in Wikipedia that after he became a member, Galileo always signed all his papers as Galileo Galilei Linceo. So um, <clears throat> Paolo is in his footsteps. Uh, he got the Balsan Prize in 2006. And tonight again, this evening, he'll get the Dan David Prize. Please, Paolo.
Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, speak about uh, Boomerang and Maxima. I, I tried to be poetic and I wrote uh, Exploring Cosmic Horizons, uh, but uh, you will see that uh, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, literally true, so uh, I'll try to convince you about this. Um, we heard about uh, this uh, wonderful tool we have to study the early universe, which is the cosmic microwave background. Uh, here is uh, a new plot uh, with, uh, where the error bars are visible, but these are 400 sigma error bars, so you see. You can always show them. But <laughs> okay, is um, evidence for a hot and early, early phase of the universe because of the thermal spectrum and because of its isotropy. And uh, uh, this uh, isotropy, uh, remember from the COBE experiment, uh, we got evidence uh, from anisotropy at the level of 10 parts per million. So this uh, high degree of isotropy is, uh, to some extent, surprising. Why? Because the, these photons come uh, from an epoch when the universe was uh, 380,000 years old. So we see a region of the universe uh, as it was uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The region we can map, uh, however, is uh, much wider than that size, so contains uh, regions uh, which didn't have time to interact. And uh, in a static universe, uh, these regions uh, could not be in causal contact. So why? they show the same brightness, which means the same temperature. Um, this is the usual uh, plot uh, where uh, along the line you have distance and uh, look back time. And uh, uh, we uh, see all the way um, to a, an epoch when the universe was 3,000 Kelvin hot. This is about uh, 14 billion years ago and 14 billion light years away. Uh, when we look at different regions, uh, those regions can be very distant, <coughs> giga light years, okay? So there is no way they can be in causal contact. And uh, um, this is what we call the problem of cosmic horizons, uh, to have uh, uh, to get to the same temperature, we, get, we need uh, to have contact in some way, radiation uh, uh, forces, uh, something uh, which makes contact between two regions uh, to drive them to the same temperature. However, we live in an expanding universe, uh, so regions separated by more than 380,000 light years might have been in causal contact before, earlier than when we see the light. And, uh, however, this is not the case, because in a universe made of uh, matter and radiation, the expansion rate uh, decreases with time. This comes directly from the Friedman equation, which is uh, one way to write uh, the Einstein field equations in the case of uh, uh, homogeneous and isotropic fluid. If the fluid is made, made of matter and radiation, the answer is that uh, the expansion rate uh, will decrease which means that uh, uh, a, a region as large as the horizon, 380,000 light years, uh, when the CMB is released, when we take the picture, that region uh, was, has not been in causal contact before. Uh, is divided in smaller regions, was divided before then in smaller regions, which were not in causal contact. And, uh, nor has been in causal contact with the regions uh, surrounding. So we have a paradox. And uh, um, why that? Was this temperature regulated everywhere at the very beginning? Who did that? Uh, or is there some uh, wrong assumption, for example, about the composition of the universe? Maybe the universe is not made just of matter and radiation, it's made of something else. And so we can conclude, we can't conclude that that is uh, uh, decreasing its uh, uh, expansion rate. 
there is another paradox, the flatness paradox. The expansion rate uh, is uh, regulated by these equations I told you before. And uh, if contains only matter of radiation, it either collapses or dilutes uh, with the rate which depends on the total average amount of uh, uh, matter and radiation, on the average mass energy density. So if you want uh, to have the universe with about uh, the same density it has today, uh, you have to regulate this density, its average mass density, very precisely at the beginning. Otherwise, it uh, will uh, um, expand and dilute very fast or uh, collapse very fast as well. So, for example, here is a plot of the distances, the expansion of distances in the universe versus time, and uh, the numbers are, are the density of the universe in the three cases, uh, one nanosecond after the Big Bang. And you see the numbers are exactly the same, but the last digit, which changes by one uh, uh, gram per cubic centimeter. So you understand, this is a... Uh, uh, if you want uh, to get uh, here after 14 billion years uh, with about uh, the density you see, you have to be this precise at the beginning. This is another paradox. We don't like this fine tuning. Uh, the solution uh, is called uh, cosmic inflation, or at least this is one of the popular solutions for this problem. And uh, the idea, with an appealing idea, is that uh, subatomic scales uh, where uh, uh, um, there is, uh, at the very beginning, at extremely high energies, there is a quantum field dominating the energy density of the universe. Fluctuations are responsible for, uh, at some point, uh, somewhere, uh, a very fast expansion of the universe uh, corresponding, probably, to, an, to the energy scales of the grand unification. Uh, I said probably, I said uh, maybe, because uh, uh, we have many theories of inflation, and uh, of course we need uh, to have good data to try to validate these theories. Anyway, uh, if you assume that there is this kind of uh, very fast expansion of the universe at the very beginning, then in this case you can uh, uh, zoom in the very beginning, and uh, what you see is that uh, a tiny fraction of the universe expands very fast and uh, goes outside the causal horizon so that uh, um, the region or even all the universe we can see today was initially, before inflation, contained in a microscopic volume. So this is the idea. Uh, what can we do to test it? Uh, inflation uh, is appealing because it provides uh, a physical process uh, to origin density fluctuations. We have quantum fluctuations. They inflate to cosmological uh, scales uh, producing density fluctuations. These density fluctuations will then um, ev evolve uh, and produce uh, the structure, galaxies, uh, clusters of galaxies. Uh, inflation is appealing because it uh, explains the flatness paradox uh, simply because if there is an initial curvature, because the average density is very high, for example, that will be uh, flattened by the huge expansion of the universe using inflation. Uh, explain the horizon paradox, as uh, I've just shown, and uh, is moderately predictive because uh, from uh, quantum theory you can uh, uh, compute, uh, which is the spectrum of density fluctuations, and you expect Gaussian and the scale invariant density fluctuations, which is a feature you can test experimentally with an experiment with good sensitivity and angular resolution. So um, inflation theory was developed in the 80s. Uh, 
uh, then uh, there are maybe 50 different uh, uh, variations around this theory, but these basic predictions are common to all these variations. And uh, um, what we need is an experiment which is able to image with good resolution the size of the causal horizon at when the CMB is released. And uh, this uh, size is about one degree. And uh, uh, you can compute it uh, quite easily because uh, you know that uh, the causal horizon is uh, about uh, uh, 380,000 light years, uh, somewhere. Okay. And uh, you see this size from a distance, which is 14 billion light years. And meanwhile, the universe expands by a thousand times. If you do the calculation, the result is about one degree. So uh, this is basically the size you need to image with the good resolution. So you expect to see structures with a scale of basically uh, one degree or less, while the resolution of COBE was of the order of 10, 7 degrees. And uh, um, experimentalists after COBE started to work very hard to develop uh, high resolution experiments. So we heard from Paul what uh, uh, part of what uh, has been done. And uh, um, these experiments, uh, the purpose of these experiments, uh, in addition to test inflation, could have been to uh, test the geometry of space and the physics happening inside um, causally connected regions uh, before releasing the CMB. So if, uh, for example, the energy density of the universe is not the critical one, the angle subtended by the horizon can be uh, wider or smaller than one degree, uh, simply because of the remaining curvature of the universe. Uh, so we expect to see in the three cases, uh, in a critical density universe, uh, degree-sized spots. In a high density universe, uh, uh, larger spots. In a low density universe, uh, smaller spots. So the expectation was to be able to uh, measure the curvature of the universe at uh, larger scales. Within uh, one causally connected region, um, there are two uh, forces acting on a density fluctuation. One is gravity, of course. The other one is photon pressure. And since we have a very high number of photons per um, matter particle, uh, photon pressure is very important. And uh, uh, what happens uh, so is that uh, if we have a an overdensity, the overdensity will start uh, to collapse uh, due to its own gravity. Doing that will become hotter, and the pressure of photons will increase uh, and will stop uh, the collapse, uh, and uh, the uh, density will bounce back uh, until the perturbation will cool down enough that gravity starts again to nominate. So you understand that this is uh, an oscillation process and uh, uh, will go on as long as there is contact between uh, radiation and matter. Um, after the universe uh, becomes neutral, below 300,000 degrees, uh, then this contact uh, uh, is not as strong as before and the density perturbation will continue to collapse and to become nonlinear and form structures. And uh, so, studying uh, this uh, map, we can start the study the physics uh, earlier, a bit uh, like when we look and analyze the fluctuation on the surface of the sun, sun we uh, study the internal structure of the sun. How can we do it? 
we need uh, angular resolution. The COBE satellite was a small satellite uh, and had uh, just uh, antennas uh, to define uh, the angular resolution of the micron radiometers. To have uh, higher angular resolution, we did uh, a real telescope. And the micro telescope, uh, possibly at uh, high frequencies, uh, smaller wavelengths, uh, higher resolution. Uh, at 150 gigahertz, there is the peak brightness of the cosmic microwave ground, so it's a good frequency to work at. And, uh, uh, but uh, to have uh, low sky noise and high transparency, we have to go outside the Earth atmosphere. Um, the highest sensitivity uh, detectors at this frequency are cryogenic bolometers, and also you need to check uh, other frequencies uh, in order to distinguish between what is uh, CMB and what is uh, foreground emission. And in the 90s, uh, several experiments uh, started to do this. Uh, uh, in Italy, we had uh, this program called uh, Argo. In the US, uh, uh, there was MAX, there was MSAM, and uh, other uh, experiments. Um, if we want, uh, and uh, those experiments uh, had uh, statistical samples of the sky, as uh, Paul has uh, shown. Uh, in order to have the real maps, so to sample many more directions in the sky, we need uh, to uh, increase uh, the sensitivity and the sky coverage. Uh, and there are two options to do that. Either uh, to cool down the detectors to a very low temperature and use a regular balloon flight uh, uh, of uh, several hours to do your measurements, or uh, to um, have uh, still high sensitivity but uh, less uh, uh, performance uh, at a slightly higher temperature and use a long duration flight. And uh, uh, this were, was the difference between the two approaches of uh, uh, Maxima and uh, uh, Boomerang. Uh, this is, uh, has been shown by Paul and uh, was uh, the situation suggesting uh, a peak uh, of uh, uh, fluctuations in brightness at about one degree. Uh, and uh, the purpose of Maxima and Boomerang was to improve over this. Here is the team of uh, Maxima. Is, uh, a experiment based in Berkeley with collaborations with other groups. And the experiment, the art of the experiment was this array of bolometers cooled at 100 milli K. And the radiation was focused on the entrance of these light pipes uh, by a meter size uh, telescope. This is the off axis telescope focusing inside the cryostat, the microwaves, so that uh, the re angular resolution is 10 arc minutes, a sixth of a degree, so that we can have all the details we need of the cosmic microwave ground. Here is the contribution of Paul Richards to the experiments, as you see. And, and uh, uh, you can see the experiment ready to fly from Palestine, Texas, uh, where it was flown uh, several times, uh, starting in 1996, eight, I don't remember the, the yes. And uh, here is a, a happy team receiving data from the balloon during the flight, real-time data. Then we have uh, happy landings in Texas, uh, where uh, you go there and recover the instrument. Uh, you are, if you are lucky, you can even fly t again. I mean, this is very uh, direct. Well, that's. Uh, <laughs> This is uh, the map of the microwave sky uh, obtained by this uh, experiment uh, in its uh, first flight. And uh, uh, you see the scale here, so one degree is from here to here, and the spots basically have one degree size. Uh, Boomerang was uh, another uh, large collaboration. 
uh, and uh, was carried out uh, in Antarctica with uh, a similar system. Uh, here the, the, the ambient is different from Texas. Uh, and uh, the experiment has to work uh, for two weeks, uh, so it has these uh, solar panels uh, to be uh, powered. But again, uh, we have uh, an uh, off-axis telescope uh, and uh, a cryostat uh, to work uh, for two weeks uh, uh, at 300 milli-k. Uh, here there are images of the uh, um, focal plane, and uh, the experiment was flown uh, in 1998 to measure CMB anisotropy, and in 2003 to go after CMB polarization. Uh, happy landings, uh, even here. And uh, this was the map. Again, uh, if you look at the scale, uh, the structure with degree-sized uh, spots uh, is evident. But uh, Boomerang and Maxima had uh, uh, other channels uh, to check uh, that uh, the fluctuations followed the CMB anisotropy spectrum and are not due to galactic radiation. And uh, uh, this was the result uh, in uh, the first uh, early release of data from a subset of detectors uh, from Maxima and Boomerang. And uh, definitely the peak uh, at uh, multiple 200, which means one degree of angular scale, was uh, evident uh, in the data of both the experiments. So the right density we need to have uh, to produce uh, degree-sized uh, um, horizons uh, is uh, the critical density. That was uh, the main result of these two experiments, uh, which uh, had uh, um, uh, were published uh, in s several papers, but uh, then uh, the analysis uh, was uh, refined. Uh, we added more uh, channels. Uh, we uh, removed better uh, uh, other effects. In the end, uh, not only we saw the main peak, but also the overtones, uh, which uh, uh, depend of the, on the physics uh, of the oscillations uh, in the uh, primeval plasma. Uh, I think I can skip uh, here. We have uh, a very detailed uh, uh, theory to compare this data to. And uh, the theory is very detailed because uh, the physics we are using uh, is quotes and quotes uh, simple, is linear physics. Uh, and uh, is uh, a plasma which is uh, in conditions which are well uh, experimented. So uh, it's uh, almost again uh, you change the parameters on the, of the theory and you find the, the best fit of the data. And uh, you find that uh, the three main parameters you can constrain with these uh, uh, experiments are the total, total mass energy density which is the critical one, is the spectral index of, uh, of the temperature fluctuations, and the spectral index of one is what is expected from uh, inflation, and that was another indication of uh, uh, inflation. And finally, the density of baryons, which affects uh, the overtones uh, of the measurement, uh, which is totally consistent uh, with uh, the density of uh, baryons uh, you find from uh, primordial nucleosynthesis. So that's another important uh, uh, check of the uh, theory. If you combine this data together with other data, you find the evidence uh, for uh, a dark energy contribution to the total mass energy density of the universe and for this uh, strange composition of the universe in which normal matter is only 4% of the total. Uh, there is uh, one additional prediction of the inflation theory, which is uh, uh, a production of uh, a stochastic background of gravitational waves uh, during the inflation phase. These gravitational waves uh, are very faint. Uh, it's very unlikely we will be ever be able uh, to detect them with direct uh, detection of gravitational waves, but they induce uh, a very peculiar pattern of uh, polarization 
in the cosmic microwave background. So this uh, has to be done, but is one of the targets of the uh, future research of uh, CMB. We uh, started uh, an activity to measure this uh, uh, by changing the detectors in boomerang and flying it again with the polarization sensitive detector uh, developed at uh, Caltech. And uh, uh, we had the first uh, detections of uh, CMB polarization, not accurate enough uh, to select, to, to find uh, statistical evidence for uh, inflationary gravitational waves, but at least uh, good enough to show that uh, this uh, polarization effect uh, in the cosmic microwave background is present. Uh, in summary, boomerang maxima have been uh, a breakthrough because they provided uh, these uh, resolved uh, images of the early universe uh, where causal horizons are evident, uh, and from them it was possible to select uh, cosmological parameters. Also, required the development of a generation, of new generation of detectors, uh, um, which then had been used in uh, satellite mission in Planck, as you heard, there are these detectors. Um, also, they required a, a data analysis uh, uh, effort, a new data analysis effort to uh, extract the best possible maps to the data sets and to extract the power spectrum and compare to uh, models. And uh, finally, they used the stratospheric balloons uh, as a cheap way to go in uh, near space. Uh, and uh, again, uh, we will go through this process for the uh, forthcoming uh, um, experiments, uh, as uh, um, Andrew will uh, describe in a while. Thank you. What is cheap? He wants to build. The bill for the balloon flight uh, is uh, between 100 and 1,000 times less than a satellite. So that's, that's the comparison you have to do. Uh, is the, the balloon itself is about 100,000 euros, uh, and then you add the campaign cost, uh, say, 1 million euros. Okay, we'll go on to the third talk then by uh, Andrew. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here. This is also my first trip to Israel. I'm having a lovely time here. It's also a really wonderful opportunity. I guess it's kind of rare to get to share a prize with your mentor. And I've been telling all of my students that I hope they get to do the same thing someday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the future. We've learned so much from the microwave background already. You could ask, what more is there to learn? And that's what I'm going to try to answer in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, there's a flurry of activity. I'll only hit on, on uh, a few of the experiments, but you see some of them here that I'll, that I'll be mentioning. Um, so just to summarize what the microwave background has revealed to us so far, it has given us almost overwhelming in, uh, evidence that this curious thing called inflation actually happened. And just for those of you who aren't experts, the standard model of cosmology now includes the following scenario, that our entire observable universe was once smaller than the nucleus of an atom and then sprung to macroscopic dimensions, roughly the theorists tell me about this big, <laughs> literally, <laughs> um, in a tiny fraction of a second, which is just, uh, some might call it an unbelievable <laughs> idea. <laughs> Uh, and yet, it has passed many, many tests. And there's one really uh, further test that, that, it, that it must pass, and we're hoping that we can make that test. But what we've learned in terms of precision cosmology is that the universe is uh, about 13.7 billion years old now. 
Uh, most remarkable, perhaps, is that uh, only 4% of the universe is made of the stuff that you and I are made of. Uh, about 22% of it is some unknown type of cold, dark matter. And more mysterious still, still is about that 74% of it or so is some sort of dark energy. We don't know anything about the dark energy. Uh, it's, uh, it's a rubric for, uh, that encapsulates our, our, our ignorance. Um, really, what's happening is the universe uh, is accelerating in its expansion uh, at the current epoch, and we don't really understand why. We, we say it's due to this, to this dark energy. Okay? So what do we do next after having learned all this? The, of the three things I mentioned, uh, or the, the several things on the, on the recent slide, um, there are two things that the microwave background will have a lot to say about, we think. The first is dark energy. Dark energy, the effects of dark energy become pronounced uh, in the relatively recent universe. That is the last uh, two thirds or so of the universe's history. Uh, it's then that the effects of dark energy, this increased uh, expansion rate, uh, become most, most pronounced. And I'll describe in a few minutes uh, how we can try to learn a little bit about dark energy through microwave background, we're going to, do, we're going to be using something which Paul mentioned, this so-called sanyayev zeldovich effect in uh, clusters. And in this case, what we're doing is we're using the microwave background as a uniform backlight to the current universe. In, in these kinds of measurements, we have relatively large signals, about 100 microkelvin or so, which in our field these days is a relatively large signal. But on small scales of about an arc minute or so, and that, as Paul mentioned, that means that we'll require about a, a, a 10 meter telescope uh, operating from the ground and lots of detectors. The second thing I'll talk about is how we can learn more about inflation and specifically, we hope, uh, s at least begin to probe the type of physics that drove inflation. And we're going to learn about that by mapping the polarization of the microwave background. In this case, we're going to use this very special symmetry uh, that the polarization has to search for gravitational radiation, as Paolo mentioned. And here, the signals are very, very small, perhaps 10 nanokelvin or smaller. Uh, but the, the one thing that makes it a little bit easier is the, is the characteristic angular scale that we'll be looking for on the sky is, is quite a bit larger uh, degree scales, which means that we can use uh, a smaller a smaller telescope, but we need telescopes uh, equipped with very good polarimeters. So I often um, show this slide, which is a little bit of a joke. Um, physics proceeds by judicious oversimplification, right? And uh, although we call ourselves astrophysicists, um, we who study the microwave background ignore all this interesting stuff that happens here in the recent universe, the stars, the galaxies, planets, etc. It's all very interesting, but it's all very complicated as well. And it's much easier to study the very early universe. We can um, think that we have license to do that because in fact the microwave background radiation, if you look at all the electromagnetic energy in the universe today, uh, most of it is still in the form of the microwave background. Uh, radiation, it completely dominates that energy density. So what we, what Paolo showed you were the maps of this surface, the surface of last scattering, uh, when the universe had cooled sufficiently to form neutral atoms for the first time at about this age or so. Uh, and Paolo and Paul both described the process of acoustic oscillations that happens back in this epoch of, of the universe. Looking towards the future, now there are two, um, two new topics, and one is going to study this part of the universe, and the other is going to try to get way back to there. So I'm going to speak first about, uh, about this epic. Right. Now we have to be careful here, because as I mentioned, things get very, very complicated. And if you proceed down the list here, you can decide how far down this list you want to go and still be able to calculate anything. Okay? <laughs> I think we're talking about politics later this afternoon. <laughs> Those are much smarter people than, than, than we are. Uh, I get confused way up here at the top. Um, however, there is a process that happens in this part of the universe which can teach us about dark energy. Uh, and it is the following. Right? So this is a most remarkable picture. 
Uh, this is a picture of a cluster of galaxies. You can see that there's lots of galaxies here. But you'll also notice that there's some funny arcs in this picture. And these are actually the gravitationally lensed images of galaxies that are far more distant from this cluster. So the concentration of mass in this cluster here is acting as a gravitational lens and giving us a distorted image of a far more distant galaxy. You can use this fact to deduce the amount of matter in this cluster of galaxies. And you find out that it's much, much larger than the matter you would associate just with the galaxies. Okay? And it turns out what we understand now is that when we look at a, at a cluster of galaxies, you know, the, the things that we're seeing are a tiny contribution to the total mass. Mostly, this is a concentration of this dark matter in the universe, which has attracted lots of matter into it. Some of that matter has formed galaxies. Okay? Um, here you see the same cluster imaged in visible light by the Hubble Space Telescope and in the X-ray by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Okay? Images look very, very different. Okay? And what you're seeing here is a map of the hot uh, intercluster medium, all the gas that's been drawn into this gravitational potential well by falling in. It's heated up to a temperature of about a million degrees Kelvin. There's a big ionized plasma here. Okay? And this actually traces out the distribution of dark matter relatively well. It's also, as a physicist, right, this is a nice kind of spherical object, much simpler to contemplate than all of this complicated stuff over here. So the most important things are that the clusters are mostly made of dark matter, and of the baryonic matter, most of that is in the form of this hot intergalactic gas. We can virtually ignore the galaxies. So what happens? Um, you know, what we, the reason that we're able to look out and get this clear map of the microwave background right back here is that's a very good approximation after the first atoms form. Uh, the light from the Big Bang, the microwave background, doesn't interact at all for the rest of the history of the universe until the photons meet my telescope, right, 13 billion years later. Well, that's almost true. Sometimes the microwave background photon will pass through one of these clusters. And if it does pass through a cluster, there's about a 1% chance for a typical cluster that it will interact with this ionized plasma, because after all, now the matter here is ionized just like it was back here. And when that happens, the incoming photon hits one of these electrons, which is much hotter, and it shifts in frequency to a shorter wavelength. That's the effect that Paul was, was mentioning. This is called the sanayev zeldovich effect. And so when you're looking through the path of the cluster, uh, the spectrum shifts, for example, from this blue curve to this red curve at frequencies lower than about 200 gigahertz, you actually get a decrease in the brightness. And at frequencies greater than about 200 gigahertz, you get an increase. Okay? And this is actually a map of that effect made by a camera developed by Paul's group at Berkeley, uh, put on the South Pole Telescope. And it is the most remarkable thing. There aren't many things in astrophysics which look like a dark patch on a uniformly bright background. Okay? So that's one of the remarkable, uh, several remarkable parts of this uh, effect. Now, the cameras that Paul and his group have developed have gotten so sophisticated that we can now, using these large ground-based 10 meter telescopes, map large parts of the sky and for the first time begin to detect these clusters in this uh, effect. All right? So this is just uh, to give you a, an idea of the scale of the, of the sophistication of these cameras. They're not quite what's in your in your digital camera with 10 million pixels, but they're getting there. And I think we'll be up to, up to 10,000 in the, in the years to come. And these are the kinds of telescopes that are being used. The Apex Telescope in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, the South Pole Telescope, obviously at the South Pole. This is uh, another experiment called BICEP, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And uh, Paolo's group is developing some balloon-borne instruments to measure the higher frequency components of this effect, which you can't see from the ground. And they as well have a proposal uh, in to do something uh, from orbit. Mm -hmm. So why all this effort? What's the big deal? If you can see the clusters in x-rays and get that nice, simple, spherical picture, 
and understand a lot about the clusters. The problem is what we want to do is we want to understand how clusters evolve back over the last two-thirds or three-quarters or so of the history of the universe because uh, that will teach us something about the so-called equation of state of this dark energy. How quickly dark energy becomes important as the evolution of the universe proceeds affects the rate at which these clusters will form. To do that, we want to be able to make some kind of observation that creates an accurate census of all clusters as we see back and back and back. The problem is if you do most, most cosmological observations, as things get further away, they get much more difficult to see. And so any measurement that you make where you try to make a census of the whole population fails at the largest distances because you can't see them anymore. The sanyayev zeldovich effect has a most remarkable and unique property. And that is the things are as bright no matter how far away they are. And I, and I can explain that briefly just by, or I can wave my hands a little bit, saying that I've described that this effect is due to the interaction of the hot cluster gas with the microwave background. Now, of course, the microwave background is 2.7 degrees Kelvin now, but if I go back in the early universe, it was brighter and brighter. And it turns out that the increased brightness, the increased temperature of the microwave background as I go further back just compensates for the other effects that would make the cluster uh, uh, appear dimmer. And so I have this beautiful way then of doing an unbiased census, census rather, of, of clusters all the way back. And this field is just about to get off the ground uh, due to the kinds of technological innovation uh, that Paul described. And that will be very important in the coming years. So uh, I'm going to end my discussion of the sanyayev zeldovich effect by just annotating my original picture now. right? And we're still going to ignore all the galaxies and things in this epoch of the universe. But pretty soon, physicists will have mapped out uh, what the distribution of these clusters is as a function of redshift in the relatively recent universe. OK, so now I want to then turn to the second of these two topics, uh, the physics of inflation, and try to describe to you how it is that we might someday uh, be able to actually probe well beyond what in all other ways is an opaque wall. Okay? So there's a, a very good review, if I'm not able to completely describe this well in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, last month in Nature, there was a, a nice kind of news, news, news feature about, about how this whole business goes. And here's a picture of, uh, of the Planck satellite. This is looking down on the top of the Planck uh, telescope. So what does Planck have to do with this, and how can we further test inflation with the microwave background? Let me first mention that uh, Planck did launch just last uh, Thursday. When I went, it's been a long time coming. When I went through my view graphs to pull out a slide for Planck, the first one I pulled up said Planck, and then parentheses, launch in 2007. <laughs> okay. So 2009 now, and it finally did launch. It's on its way out to the second Lagrangian point of the Earth-Sun system, which is approximately uh, 1.5 million kilometers uh, on the, uh, away from the Earth opposite the Sun. Uh, it's launched warm. And there's a very complicated chain of coolers that will eventually cool the detectors down to 100 millikelvin. They should be cold if all goes well uh, by about July 1st, right? If you don't start hearing some of us talking about the cold detectors sometimes in, uh, in July, uh, we're probably going to be quiet for a long time. Uh, <laughs> if all goes well, the sky survey should begin around August 1st, and after that, uh, everything should be calm and we'll survey the sky for about uh, two years. This is just gives you an idea of the complexity inside. I'll just say that all of the technologies on Planck, including the telescope, um, the detectors, some of the cooling systems, et cetera, they were all proven on balloon-borne experiments, uh, Maxim and Boomerang among the first, and then, and then later on Archaeops. Okay, so how do we probe, further probe inflation with the microwave background? Um, here's a, a kind of funny artist concept of the history of, of the universe. And from the current epoch, we look back and we see this, uh, this opaque wall here. Right? What we really want to do is we want to look well beyond that to a much, much earlier time. 400,000 years, which is the epoch 
of the, of the images that we, we can make now is pretty early. It's equivalent to imaging one of you about one hour after you were conceived, when you were still a single cell. All right? But we want to look much, much further back still. And the reason is that um, on, from a physicist's point of view, in terms of energy scales and temperatures, although it's impressive that we can look back to a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, we haven't really started to explore new physics. However, if we could somehow see all the way back to inflation itself, we would then reach energy scales, which are larger than the energies that we'll ever achieve in any accelerator built on the, on the face of the Earth. So that's, um, that's very compelling. But how can we do that? Because this image, right, the microwave background, is the furthest we can ever see using electromagnetic radiation. That's the opaque wall that Paul mentioned beyond which we can't see. We have to use some other form of, of energy that propagates through the universe. And uh, the preferred form, the only thing that we know about that will allow us to look all the way back to the epoch of inflation is gravitational radiation. Inflation, you can think of as the mother of all accelerations in the universe. When you accelerate mass, you make gravitational radiation. And so there, is, there was a, an intense uh, background of gravitational radiation in the very early universe, that of course has been redshifted, and the energy content has decreased, uh, and and the redshift of this is some very very en uh, enormous number. So the gravitational radiation we're looking for now, not that we've ever seen a gravity wave yet, but the gravitational radiation that we're looking for now uh, is very low amplitude and very long wavelengths. So the key to doing this is that that gravitational radiation will affect the polarization of the microwave background. Now, the microwave background is polarized in a very prosaic way, in a way that we understand well and have actually measured now. And it's polarized for the following simple reason. When I look out, what I'm doing is I'm, you know, look at the microwave background, I'm looking at photons that are coming at me from this time when the universe was a thousand times smaller than it is today. And that photon will have scattered off some electron at the epoch just before atoms formed and then come to me now. If that electron in its rest frame sees a quadrupole temperature anisotropy, that is, the temperature is hotter here than it is here, right, then the way Thompson scattering works, in this polarization, I'm looking at this temperature, and in this polarization, I'm looking in this temperature. So this is a very well-known effect, and the theory has all been worked out. You can predict exactly what the temperature uh, what, or rather what the polarization is going to look like on the sky, and it has a very special symmetry. It has something called zero curl. So everyone here in the room who took electromagnetism back in college, you remember that the E field also has this property of zero curl, and for that reason we call this the E mode polarization. Right? It's very, very faint. Here's a simulation of what the polarization would look like. The color is the temperature. The little lines are the polarization. Um, typically, the polarization is about 1% or so of the temperature anisotropy, right? So the microwave background was discovered in 1964. It wasn't until the year 2000 that we made resolved images. So how long should it be before we're able to study something at 1% of that level? Well, it turns out that uh, Moore's law, or I'll call it Richard's law, because <laughs> it's going faster than Moore's law, uh, is working very, very well. And we're already able, as you'll see, to make images of the polarization of this uh, prosaic form. Okay? And in fact, Planck, which was just launched, is going to do a really good job. Here's this power spectrum, again showing here's the thing that Maxima and, and Boomerang first measured these peaks here. Now WMAP has done a good job. And in fact, with other ground-based experiments, we've actually measured five of these peaks now. Okay? But way below that is another power spectrum of the, of the type of so-called E-mode polarization that I've just described. Okay? And you can see it has its own complicated features. But it's down here at a level, this, is, this corresponds to one microkelvin on the sky here. Okay? So here's the challenge. This is uh, the picture I just showed you without gravi uh, gravitational radiation. And now I'm going to show you what happens in the presence of gravitational, ra ra gravitational radiation to the pattern. Okay? I'm going to flip back and forth. So that's gravity waves, and that's no gravity waves. Now, if I, as I'm flipping back and forth, you'll notice there's a little change in the colors of the two pictures. 
And in fact, the presence of gravitational radiation does change the temperature anisotropy, but we can't use that because it's degenerate with other effects. So it's cheating. You can't look at the colors, all right? You have to draw your attention to the little tiny shifts in these lines, and that's what we have to try to measure. So not only do we have to measure polarization below a microkelvin, but we have to do it with enough fidelity that we can do vector calculus on that. Okay. So will Planck be able to do this? Well, the answer is maybe. And the answer is maybe because we don't know how well Planck's going to work at these very, very low levels. We also don't know how big the signal's supposed to be. So if everything worked really, really well, and the signal was as big as it possibly could be, then Planck will see this. All right, and I'll let you calculate the odds of that. <laughs> okay? Or it may be that, we, that Planck won't see it, because as Paul mentioned, there are many, many kinds of inflation. More types of inflation than there are people working in the field. <laughs> okay? And it could very well be, it could very well be that, that inflation, that, that the type of, the amplitude of gravitational radiation that inflation produced is so low that we'll never see it. And that's why I have this little picture here. This is a wild goose chase, in case you haven't figured that out. All right? And it could be that we never see any signal. Right? Still, it's such an interesting problem that some of us are compelled uh, to go tackle it. So how do we go and search uh, for this faint signal? How on earth, literally, can we hope to, to do it? And I say on earth because it's going to be a long time before there's another satellite past Planck. So the first rule is, be patient and teach your students well. Okay? This is going to take a long time, perhaps. And I just wanted to take the opportunity uh, to say that I am very, very, very grateful for having had a couple of great mentors in my career and also for having great students. I'm not sure I deserve any of them. And I'd also like to point out um, Francesco Melchiori. Uh, and I wish he could be here today. Right? And this was Paolo's uh, mentor. Uh, but Francesco and Paul really, really pioneered uh, most of the technology and the field that we're talking about. And uh, Paul has produced uh, a number of remarkable students, including uh, this guy, John Mather. All right. So uh, I'm going to now talk just for a few minutes about some work that we're doing down at the South Pole, um, which I hope will be able to detect this gravi gravitational wave signal, or at least uh, help pave the way towards that. Why would one go to the South Pole of all places? It turns out that this is a remarkably fun and easy place to work for an astronomer. Right? Um, the best target region in the whole sky for this kind of work is available 24 hours a day because it just goes around like this. It's at about 60 degrees elevation from the South Pole. Not many people realize the South Pole is pretty high elevation. It's 10,500 feet. It's all ice. <laughs> um, the sun is, of course, below the horizon for six months, et cetera, et cetera. It may, not, it may surprise you to learn that it's relatively easy access to the telescope once you're down there. Uh, this is where we live. That's the runway, and these are the telescopes. So you don't have to drive for half an hour up the mountain. You just have to walk across the runway. Um, and here's the South Pole Telescope that I mentioned before, and this is what produced that Sonia Zeldovich image. So this has a camera developed at Berkeley on it. Uh, here's the BICEP experiment that I'll uh, mention briefly, and this is where an experiment called Quad uh, was in place and where we're going to place something uh, called uh, the Kekere. But I'm not kidding about any of this stuff. In the new station down here, there's a basketball court. There's a sauna. It's a, it's a wonderful place to live. And I can tell you, too, it doesn't take too much more time, actually, in real time, to get from L.A. to the South Pole than it does to get here, <laughs> <laughs> especially on a Saturday. Um, <laughs> So the great thing about this work is we can use small telescopes because the signals are big on the sky. We ha we're using just a 30 centimeter diameter telescope. We put lots of detectors in. It has a very large field of view. We crate it up. We bring it down to the South Pole. That's uh, what the old focal plane looks like. We're done with this experiment now. Um, there are two experiments that are now finished. And uh, one of them, Quad, has published results. The other one, BICEP had better published results soon. 
And uh, I'll just show you too, this is what looks like when the sun finally goes down. And for those of you who have argued about the presence of the green flash, right? <laughs> there it is. It lasts for minutes at the south. You can just go out and take a picture of it, right? And uh, once you have a, an instrument operating over the winter, this is the aurora, that's the moon, um, it's calm, it, uh, it just operates continuously 24-7, you get lots of data, your winter over has time to do things like this, even when it's minus 100 Fahrenheit out. Um, and a couple years later, and some data analysis later, you produce maps like this. Now these are maps now, not of the temperature, but of these um, so-called E-modes, and B mode. So the E mode is the, the prosaic form of polarization. The other one, the gravitational waves, they produce a curl in the map. They distort that symmetry, so they produce something that we call a B mode. And this is this this is the state of the field that we're at. Um, you can see here, this is the signal, and this is when we difference the data, so this is just noise. And these are the E modes. And this is from the quad experiment, which is looking on small angular scales of arc minutes. So these are, are in, uh, are in uh, degrees here, right? Um, and what you can see is that we see the E mode signal very, very clearly, well above the noise. And the B mode signal is still consistent with noise. So this is very, very important because what it's telling us is that we've achieved the sensitivity to measure the E-mode, but we've also achieved the fidelity to separate the E-mode from the B-mode. And so far, at this level, we wouldn't expect to see B-mode yet uh, in these maps, and, and we don't. So that's all very gratifying, and it's the first step along the way. We're also beginning to see this pattern of structure. So there's structure in the E-mode spectrum, much like there is in the temperature power spectrum. And we can see that now as well, and it's all very consistent with theory. So, all, so our tool for doing this work is all in, in place now, and so far we have only these upper limits on the B mode. Now, this is again this multipole moment. Uh, this is a level of one microkelvin. The signal that is predicted from the gravitational wave background due to inflation would be concentrated on angular scales about here, and it would be at a level maybe down in here somewhere, right? And this is data from the quad experiment. BICEP is a sister experiment, which is looking just in this region at larger angular scales. And this is what I can show you so far from the BICEP experiment. Now, these are much bigger maps. So this is uh, spanning uh, about 40 degrees on the sky. And this is the temperature map. And this is the E-mode map now very, very faint plus or minus 1.5 microkelvin, the full stretch on the map, because at these large angular scales, even the E-mode signal becomes very, very faint. But again, you see, we can image the E-mode, and we have uh, no detection yet uh, of the B-mode. So that's the state of the field. Um, it's gone much faster than we would have expected, uh, and yet we're hungry for more. You saw a few slides back the picture of the focal plane that had all those funny feed horns on it. Um, and Paul showed you a picture of some dipole antennas in a silicon wafer. This is a similar technology, right? Now this is a whole focal plane. Each pixel is this big. It's made up of an array of those dipole an antennas, right? And so we've done away with the feed horns entirely. This means we can now fabricate much larger focal planes with many more detectors relatively cheaply. And these kinds of things will be deployed on all kinds of experiments. There's an experiment called Polar Bear uh, being done by the Berkeley Group. Um, similar polarimeters will be put on the South Pole Telescope. We're upgrading BICEP with this technology, and there's also a balloon-borne experiment called SPIDER uh, that might be a pathfinder towards a future satellite in much the way that Boomerang and Maxima were for Planck. So I'll end then by just pointing out that uh, ultimately, often, these measurements require uh, a satellite. A satellite takes many, many years and lots of money to develop. But it's much more fun <laughs> to work on the smaller scale uh, pathfinders. And very often, uh, they can do really, really wonderful science, as Paul and Paula have described. And in the coming years, um, I would stay tuned to this field. I think there's many exciting results still to come from it. Thank you.
much uh, for the questions. Perhaps I'll ask the all speakers to come forward so uh, they'll all be available here for questions. Please. Yeah. So personally, I'm not working on those measurements at all. And uh, right, but I, I wanted to advertise some of the things that that uh, that, that Paul's group is doing. I think, uh, but I, I'll just comment that I think that. Um, uh, we don't know yet what the accuracy on W will be. It'll depend on how well we eventually understand clusters, because as much as we'd like to think of them as spherical cows, they're probably not. <laughs> That's right. Um, we're not, well, we are, so, so Caltech and a few other institutions are embarked on a, building a 25-meter dish um, up in the Atacama. And so that would get you to 1 over 2.5 of an arc minute. So, right, so about uh, 20, 20 arc minutes or so. I'm sorry, tw uh, 20 arc seconds. About, about 20 arc seconds. And there is, there is a 50-meter dish in, in, uh, in Mexico which would... Um, achieve maybe about 10, 10 arc second resolution. Yes, uh, so we're going in the same direction. Uh, so what's uh, the first experiment that may have this resolution around arc minutes or so and maybe be able to see the small scale signal from the innovation in Well, the, the arc minute experiment is already on, on online. And so it's a collaboration between Chicago and Berkeley and, and other groups. And that's the, uh, the South. The South Pole, uh, South Pole Telescope. I'm sorry, this is. I I don't know what sensitivity would be required for that.